and whopping zero viewers. <laughs> yeah, wait for some people to get on before you start. Absolutely. All right, now they're filing in here. All right, moving up. Got three total viewers. Welcome, everybody. We're going to pass a little time here when we let people come into the broadcast. I'm Spence Collins. I'm the president of the Austin Woods and Waters Club. And i um, sitting here in the comfort of my home office. And um, we're going to have uh, some guest speakers today. And they're all at their, their comfort of their home office. So um, I guess I'm going to tell a hunting story while people are coming in. I've got the opportunity to go uh, dove hunting on Sunday out in Hondo, Texas. Uh, hadn't had a decent dove hunt around here. And so I uh, found a outfitter for a day trip, took my wife and daughter and uh, George Robinson and his son. And five of us went out to Hondo on Sunday afternoon to get after some white wings. There were plenty of them, plenty of white wings in Hondo. And I love that. that I've hunted in Castroville a time or two, and and then in Hondo, and it's it's really simple. You face town from three to five or five thirty, and the birds are coming out of town into the fields, the sunflower fields, and they fly high and fast. It was difficult shooting, that's for sure. Um, and if you didn't have a twelve gauge with a full choke, uh, your your skill was truly tested on there and then uh, after they stop flying from town about 5 5 30 you turn around 180 degrees and look at the fields that, that the sunflowers and the birds are feeding in and usually around six o'clock they start coming back into the town so anyway we had a fantastic uh, time and uh, shot a fair number of birds again it was tough tough hunting that's for sure so we're going to wait a minute or two more before we get kicked off here. Uh, let some more people into the broadcast here. But uh, thank you for joining us um, on a wonderful October Wednesday. First Wednesday of the month is the Woods and Waters Club meeting. And um, while we are, I'm going to give uh, recognition to our director here on StreamYard. We've got this wonderful uh, software that's actually a website that uh, allows us to do these broadcasts where we're simultaneously simultaneously broadcasting on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, former club president uh, Jimmy Kane is our director today. Come on in and say hi to everybody, Jimmy. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for your skills today, Jimmy, and uh, time, of course, as well. Jimmy lines up all our speakers this year as the club secretary and it's done a great job getting going. If you've got an idea for a speaker, please reach out to, to Jimmy or, or, or myself and uh, share that idea here. So, all right, let's uh, kind of officially get going. I'm Spence Collins again. I'm the 2020 uh, club president, uh, the year of the uh, coronavirus and forever known as the coronavirus president here. So thank you for joining our uh, online virtual luncheon here today. Uh, we, we're the Austin Woods and Waters Club. We're a social club. We like to hunt and fish and talk about it. So normally we meet at the Ben-Hur Shrine Temple when there's not a global pandemic. And um, we have a guest speaker. We'll have 50 to 90 uh, club members in, in, in uh, for our luncheon. And, um, you know, listen to that guest speaker. Our guest speakers range from club members like we have today who've done a fantastic trip and they want to share it with us to um, last month we had the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Dove Program leader Owen Fitzsimmons. We have fishing guides, we have hunting guides, we've had guides, uh, duck hunting guides from Canada and the Panhandle. We've had fisher uh, people from the coast, from um, uh, inland as well as far as streams and, and striper fishing and all that kind of stuff. So uh, once we get back uh, in the meeting in person, it's a it's a fun time for us to get together and share our stories at a table of eight to ten folks while we uh, eat lunch and then listen to a guest speaker. So 
Uh, if you're not a member of the Austin Woods and Waters Club on our Facebook page, I'm not sure if you're listening through our YouTube channel or our Facebook page, but on Facebook, there's a join now button, something like you may not exactly say join now, but it says something similar to to join now. And um, you can, um, um, you know, join our club for 75 bucks a month. If you join now, your dues are paid through the end of 20. 21. So a few announcements here. I would like to recognize now, normally we have a banquet in um, October and uh, this year's is going to be online. I'm going to get to that in a minute, but uh, we have uh, corporate sponsors for our banquet. It's normally at the uh, TDS, Texas Disposal Systems Wild Game Ranch out in Creedmoor, Texas. They've got a fine facility out there and they allow us to use it and raise some money for the McBride's Foundation. The McBride's Foundation is a 501c3. It's an entity that was created by the uh, wise folks at Austin Woods and Waters back in the 80s. And uh, we raise money and di distribute that money through grants to different um, charities, different organizations, such as the Children's Down Home Ranch, um, CCA Texas gets some money, 4-H clubs get some money, um, Quail Unlimited type folks and uh, the Bob White Brigades, the other brigades get money, um, Texas Youth Hunting Programs uh, we are big sponsors of and they get some money as, as well. So uh, we're not going to have that banquet uh, in person this year for obvious reasons, but we'll have it online, which I'll talk about here. In a minute, but at our banquet, we have corporate sponsors and um, we are uh, very thankful for them and their participation through the years. And so I'm going to acknowledge Plains Capital Bank has been with us. That's uh, our treasurer, Tommy Ward, and uh, they're great folks. Dynamic Systems, they're mechanical contractors. Thank you to them. Morgan Stanley has been with us for a long, long time. That's Red Stone. Uh, Independence Title, that's Colin. Parker and Jennifer Goodrum, thank you for your support. Uh, of course, TDS uh, is uh, a sponsor for them donating their facility there. Uh, we have McBride's uh, Guns there at 30th and North Lamar, where the hunt begins. Uh, and uh, also trade with Jay there in the fishing department. They've got a good fishing department also. Uh, we have Representative John Sirier, who's a representative from the Caldwell County, Bastrop County, Gonzalez, and I think into Kennedy County as well. John's one of our club members. John also is the um, uh, chairman of um, CRT, Cultural Resources and Tourism uh, Committee at the State House, and he's very vital to getting our conservation, conservation message pushed through uh, in the State uh, House of Representatives. And last but certainly not least, we have Per Sterling. They do wealth management. That's uh, Richard Hallam. He's uh, on our board of directors and helps us out uh, tremendously as well. Thank you for your corporate sponsorships. Okay, we have some hunting trips coming up. Uh, Larry Navar is our chief hunting master. And uh, if you want to go do some hunting trips, we have them. They're on our website. Uh, you need to be a member to, in order to, to come on our hunts. Uh, and we just... Uh, uh, charge the cost of the hunt plus the membership if you're not a member. Uh, so that's just 75 bucks. No reason to not go on a hunt uh, by um, have, not being a member on there. But we have some sandhill cranes and geese in the panhandle. We have more sandhill crane, cranes in Port Lavaca in December. Uh, we have a Columbus duck hunt. We have an Olton pheasant hunt that's up in the panhandle. That's December 5th and 6th. We have duck and geese. Uh, back in the Amarillo to Lubbock area, East Texas hardwood hunt. Um, and then uh, another East Texas hardwood hunt as well, timber hunt on there. So lots of good hunts that Larry has uh, planned and goes on. So be sure to check those out. Uh, we've had a push lately. I'm going to try to, I'm more of an angler than a hunter. I'm going to try to set up a um, fishing trip here in on one of the central Texas rivers uh, before the end of the month. So uh, if you'd like to go uh, fly fishing with uh, on a river guide, uh, please let us know. Drop your name in the chat there uh, or uh, look for it on our uh, 
uh, website, which is austinwoodsandwaters.org. No club, austinwoodsandwaters.org. We also have an award-winning uh, game bag newsletter that comes out every month as part of your membership. Uh, Mr. John Jefferson has been writing that and editing that for a number of years. Uh, and he does a fantastic job and uh, on that. That's part of your membership, and you'd receive that in the email uh, every year, uh, excuse me, every month on there. Okay, moving to our last uh, announcement before we get into our guest speakers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a um, uh, fundraiser each year in October, October called the McBride's Foundation Dinner. And so uh, we're going to go online as most charities and, and other groups of, of our nature are doing this year to raise a little money uh, at that uh, October 22nd. That's Thursday, October 22nd. Come right back here to the Facebook page or your, the YouTube channel and join us at 7 p.m. Uh, at that point in time, we'll have uh, the announcement. Mr. Joe Bob Everett will announce the uh, recipients of the grant uh, winners for the McBride's Foundation. I'm going to share my screen and uh, show you a little flyer that um, uh, Ginger has put together for us in application window. Where is that? Uh, entire screen. Let's see. Hopefully, this gets it to where. No. Uh, we better remove that. Okay, I was trying to get to our flyer here, but um, we have uh, some live auction items. That is, um, if you go to me for right now, thank you. Uh, live auction items, uh, including um, the, uh, where are those? Oh, here we are. We have a dove hunt, the Martins have a uh, Mike Martin and Tom Martin have a dove hunt at their ranch out in uh, Blanco County. That's for 10. We have a um, uh, whitetail management buck hunt. That's in South Texas. Mr. Jack Nash, former club president, has donated uh, a whitetail management buck. We have our founder's gun, what we call our fan founder's gun. This year is a Browning X-Bolt white gold medallion 270 with a Vortex scope on there. Uh, and then we also will wrap it up with a chocolate female Labrador retriever. So uh, we may add some more live auction items between now and then, but those are the four that we have. We don't want to have a live auction that's going to take too long into the end of the night. So um, anyway, uh, that. All right. With that said, I think I've concluded all my announcements and welcome. So, again, we thank you for coming here. You're not here to listen to me talk about stuff. You're here to listen to Mr. Don Riggins and Mr. Kevin McConnell. Both are um, active in our club and they like to hunt and fish and talk about it. So they recently took a, a, a trip to Alaska in September to the Prince of Wales, and they're going to tell us about that. So thank you, Kevin and Don, for joining us today. And uh, tell us about your trip. Thank you, Spence. Um, so Don and I uh, went up to uh, Prince of Wales Island uh, the second week of September. And um, I've put some slides together, kind of kind of talk about the trip planning and um, what I've done the last, I've been up there six times now. So I'm going to take you through some of the, uh, the past trips and kind of the, the different ways you can run a trip up to Prince of Wales. Uh, and then um, Don will jump in and add some commentary about uh, his experience. This is his first time with me up there on this uh, adventure to, uh, to Prince of Wales Island. So um, Prince of Wales Island is the fourth largest island in the United States. Uh, one of the unique things about it is that it is not, it does not have any grizzly bears. Well, there's no brown bears on the island. So while we saw bears every day, um, we didn't have, uh, you know, a fear for <coughs> being uh, on the menu. So uh, other places I've gone in Alaska, you have the, 
you know, the armed guide that's standing there as you're uh, fishing the rivers as the grizzly bears come down so that you're uh, protected. So this is one of the unique things about Prince of Wales. Uh, there are over 200 miles of paved roads. So that little picture there uh, will show you the different, uh, those uh, yellow roads uh, that are paved there. Uh, I'm not sure if the one between Whale Pass and Point Baker's paved all the way up there, but uh, pretty much all those other ones are paved. Actually, the one from Kaufman Cove down to Thorn Bay along the, the edge is, is a dirt road. But uh, another interesting fact, um, not this trip, but last year, we saw 17 foot tides where it would go like three foot below normal and then all the way up 15, 16, 17 foot above. Um, so you got a lot of the logs and stuff that get drifted up onto the edges. When it gets real high tide, it drifts all those off. So there's lots of things floating in the water out there. So uh, and Don uh, witnessed some of that. We're driving along. It looks like an island floating out in the middle of the, the ocean, but it's actually just a big log with a stump sticking up out of the, out of the side. So I'm going to show you uh, on Google Maps, if you don't know where uh, Prince of Wales Island is, this is Seattle uh, down here. So we actually fly from Austin to Seattle and then Seattle up to Ketchikan. And so um, this is uh, this is Ketchikan where we fly into, and then we stay in Thorn Bay, which is right here. Uh, this year we actually flew. We took a, a wheeled plane that flies on instruments from Ketchikan over to Cloak, and then we had the guide pick us up and drive us back over to Thorn Bay. Um, this year, because of COVID, our float plane service uh, actually went out of business like the second or third week into the COVID lockdown in February. Pacific Airlines, who we had flown with the last five years, uh, float planed in. They uh, were no longer providing or they went out of business. So let me jump back over to my slide deck here. Um, this is the uh, company that I've, I've worked with the last uh, six years that I've gone in. It's called Alaska Adventures. Uh, their website is fisherhunt.com. Uh, this is their Facebook page if you look for it on Adventure Alaska uh, Southeast. They put this up back in uh, 2014. Uh, and if you can't tell that person fishing there with the, the person with the fish on is actually me. Um, the guide actually took a picture of my daughter and I while we were fly fishing and they put it up on their Facebook page and it's been there ever since. So trip types. So this is primarily a self-guided outfit. Uh, they do provide chartered offshore days and chartered freshwater days. So you can go in and get uh, a mixture of self-guided and and, um, and guided trips. And that's what I prefer to do. So I'm, I'm doing some things uh, on my own. And over the six years, I've done a mixture and I'm gonna take you through how, um, how we've done that. So my first trip and which was, I keep selling it, saying it was my most successful trip with my daughter. Um, my daughter and I bought, bought back a hundred pounds of uh, fillets of uh, silver salmon. Uh, we chartered one day offshore we did one day uh, a freshwater guided trip. That picture that was on there, uh, we actually went back into Sarkar Lake. The guide took us back in there and we fished for sockeye salmon. So, uh, you know, my t shirt, if you see it, Return of the Sockeye is where that came from. Uh, this picture here was taken after we went on the, the guided boat um, trolling. Uh, in 2015, I took uh, my folks and my sister up there. Um, this is the picture on the right is a service that they have there. So you can take your salmon, uh, you can fly them out, you can brine them and then put them on the smoker and they'll smoke them for you, um, while you're up there. So you can eat it up there, uh, or you can bring the, uh, the smoked salmon back with you. Uh, in 2016, 
Um, this was the first time I did the what they refer to as the upgrade boat. Uh, the standard outfit, you get a 16-foot um, kind of rowboat type boat with a 25-horse motor on it. And um, this was the upgrade boat. It's about $2,000 for the week to upgrade. Um, my friend David Burns there on the left. Um, Dave Ripka, who's a member of the club, myself and my friend Terry Hull uh, went on this trip. And that trip, we did catch a 50-pound halibut um, on that one. This was 2018. Uh, eight of us went up on this one. Uh, Dave Ripka ran. He captained one of the boats, and I captained the other one. Uh, we caught two 75-pound halibut on that trip, uh, and we brought back uh, 400 pounds of fillets on that trip. Um, all eight of us each brought back 50 pounds. Uh, on that trip. Last year, and we go different times of the year, so I've been testing different uh, what the best times for you know the runs are. Um, those first two trips I did over the 4th of July, and this trip here I did the first week of August. Um, the unique thing about this week was, while well, the tides were real high, and we caught 29 Dungeness crab. So uh, if you go to a restaurant in Seattle and get a Dungeness crab, they're about 75 bucks a piece. So uh, every night we each ate uh, one and a half to two Dungeness crabs um, up there. So we uh, really lucked out on how many crab we caught uh, last year. So that was the big significance of that trip. And we've really focused on going and exploring the rivers on Prince of Wales Island for this one. Uh, we walked into a number of rivers and fly fished them and, you know, caught a variety. We did catch some silvers, um, primarily pink salmon. Uh, on this trip, we went into a river called Maybe So and caught um, some pink salmon until our arms fell off. And this is a couple pictures from the trip that Don and I went on this year. Um, also, my friend David Adams and Steve Bird uh, were on this one with us, um, there's Don and I with a couple of the silvers that we caught um, fishing a river. So what's included in these trips? You get a cabin with four beds, you get a full kitchen. So you have to do all your own cooking. And I've done it differently the first couple trips uh, with my Boy Scout background and uh, backpacking background. The first trip with my daughter, she probably hates me for it, but uh, we brought all dehydrated food and we took it all in with us. So I didn't have to do any shopping when we got up there. So I packed all the food with us and we, we did very little shopping once we got up to the island. This year, we went to the grocery store and we bought everything on the island. <clears throat> so there are a number of grocery stores on the island, so you don't have to worry about you know shortage of food or anything. But you do all of your own cooking with this setup. You also get a full-size truck, so it's a double cab, so four, four guys can sit in it. Uh, the guy's in the back seat. Um, you know, it's not a super crew like my current truck, but, um, you know, it's, it's a double cab with a little bit shorter leg room. You get the skiff, you get the crab pots, and you get the shrimp pots. So those shrimp there on the right, those were caught in a shrimp pot that we put out this year in 300 feet of water. So we stuff it full of salmon carcasses and um, we put in, um, if you zoom over to my picture here, <laughs> director, um, this tub here, we'll go buy some um, cat food and we'll put it in this um, container and we'll strap that into the, uh, the crab trap and the shrimp trap and that cat food will leak out and scent the water up more so it attracts more. We also put a light in that shrimp pot to go down. But all those shrimp we caught um, were in that shrimp pot. And then on the upgrade boats, there's an electronic puller, which it takes it, what do you say, Don, maybe five minutes to pull up that shrimp pot? Uh, depends. If it's full, it's a little tougher. <laughs> So it sits there and cranks that rope in 300 feet and you coil it up on the boat and then pull it on, pull that trap on the boat and, um, and empty it out with all of the interesting things that you catch. 
All right, next slide. So this is a picture of the quad. Um, we call it the quad because it's got four rooms on it. Uh, the room there that I'm standing there on the right, uh, that's the one again we had this year. It's got the full kitchen and the, and the two bedrooms. The rooms upstairs are a little bit smaller, but um, that's an example of some of the accommodations that they have there at Adventure Alaska. So now talking about travel considerations. Because this is an island and you have to travel in with a float plane or um, the way we did it this year on um, Air Island Express, is you, you need to plan two days to get in and two days to get out. And the reason for that is that if you have any issues with weather, which we have had, um, you may get stuck there. In the past, you know, those Alaska Airlines between a Seattle and Ketchikan were solid booked. So if you take eight guys on a trip and you miss the flight, trying to get eight seats on another flight becomes very difficult. So this, uh, this year we flew up on a Friday morning to Seattle and then into Ketchikan and we spent the night in Ketchikan. Other times I spent the night in Seattle. Um, this year was unique because we didn't take the float plane. So um, I already mentioned Pacific Air went out of business. Twice now on float planes, we have had, to, we've had our flights canceled because of fog and weather. Um, the trip that um, the first one, Dave Ripka and Terry and I went in, the wind was blowing 50 miles an hour when we landed in Ketchikan and the float planes don't fly in that, that kind of weather. So there is a ferry that runs from Ketchikan to, an, to a town called Hollis on the island. And it's about an hour and 45 minute drive from the lodge. So it's a lot longer trip to get there. And you basically lose that whole day because by the time the ferry gets in at seven o'clock and you drive back to the lodge, it's past nine. So you've, you've lost it. Um, this year, we were fortunate that we caught the first flight from Ketchikan into Cloak, and we had our truck at 10 o'clock Saturday morning. So we basically had almost that whole day uh, on the island. So we, in my view, we had an extra day this year. Um, so my plan going forward is always going to be spend the nights in Ketchikan and then travel straight to Austin from Ketchikan if I can. So flying home with fish boxes. So this is your next uh, consideration. So you spent all this money to get up there and now you're trying to get your frozen fish. So at the, the lodge, they will, you'll fillet them all out and then they will package them, freeze them, um, and put them in the freezer for you. So <clears throat> in past years, well, in this year, we stayed over in Seattle, and we've always been able to check the fish into Ken's baggage freezer at the Seattle airport. Well, we got to Ken's baggage freezer with our fish boxes Saturday night, and Ken's freezer was closed. They'd gone out of business. And so evidently this smart cart company had bought them, but they were also closed. <coughs> so last year, um, my trip with Tim Frankie uh, coming back, Tim and I traveled back um, and we got stuck in Seattle because of a uh, maintenance issue with the airplane. And so Tim and I were probably at the airport till like one in the morning trying to get our fish in the Alaska Airlines freezer. So there is a freezer that Alaska Airlines has at the baggage claim. And I walked over there this year and said, you know, we've got these fish and we're not flying out till seven. Will you store them for us? And the lady went and checked if she had room and she did. So she actually took our fish boxes and checked them into the um, checked them in and said she would get them on the plane in the morning for us. In past, and this is Alaska Airlines rule, because it's a 12 hour layover, or if it's more than 12 hours, they're gonna charge you again for your luggage. So 
having them checked it right through um, saved us that. And that's another consideration of trying to fly or stay in Ketchikan and then fly straight home on Alaska Airlines is you won't have that double baggage fee uh, going forward in the, in the future. And I've checked and there is a freezer in Ketchikan and this Aero Services will uh, charge you 10 bucks per box to keep it in the freezer there at Ketchikan. Those are those are 50 pound boxes. <clears throat> Don was carrying them around on his back. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So gear and baits. So this is a picture of the gear closet. When you get there, um, you get four salmon rods, four trolling salmon rods. You get four halibut rods and you get four spinning rods. Um, I recommend for your river fishing, that if you take your own fly rods, uh, take your own spin. I have my own three piece breakdown spinning rod, and then I take a Shimano Stratic 4000. Um, that's my river setup. Um, the, uh, the hal I have taken my halibut, my bigger reels in in the past. I've stopped doing that because the, the gear is pretty darn good um, that they have there um, for both the halibut and the, and the salmon. And that just saves a little bit of your weight. So I'm gonna go through a couple of the baits that we used this year. So if you switch back over to my camera. So um, this, is the, uh, this is the halibut jig that we usually uh, use up there. So this is what we caught the 75 pound halibuts on. Uh, it's a 12 inch curly tail grub with a one pound weight on it. Uh, as I said, we f and I fly all these up there every year. So between the four of us, we had 20 pounds of tackle that we took up. So each one of us put five pounds of tackle in our, in our boxes. On a whim, uh, my friend David Adams bought a diamond jig similar to this one up there and he actually caught he dropped it down and i was kind of laughing at him i said well i've never seen anybody catch catch anything on it he dropped it down and caught a halibut in 30 seconds on it so these things do work and then he caught a bunch of we caught a bunch of cod uh this year on it not ling cod but just regular cod on these uh diamond jigs So for our, for trolling, so the boats, the upgrade boats and the skiffs are set up with downriggers. Um, we fished with these uh, flashers. So you drag these flashers behind the boat. They can be clipped into the downrigger or we put these uh, banana weights in front of the flasher. And uh, so put about two feet between each of these. And then we, um, we caught them on, so these are called Brad's uh, cut plugs. So the hooks are here. There's a little rubber band that holds these things closed. And when they open up, they have a little foam pad inside of them. And then uh, if you've seen my other talks on uh, fish in the coast, I'm a big proponent of uh, Procure baits. So Procure Salmon Slammer is what we squeeze into that, uh, that foam pad there to add scent to your bait while you're trolling it. The other thing this year, so uh, Mike Curran, who was on my trip uh, with us two years ago, him and his wife went up to Kodiak Island last year and he said all they trolled was these coho killers. And so we trolled these this year and I couldn't keep these in the water. Um, we probably caught 150 silvers on these things. Unfortunately, they were all the eight to 10 inch version of the silver. So Don got a lot of practice uh, reeling in what we called shakers. So we call them shakers because the, the rod, you know, rod tip just shakes a little bit when those little, little guys get on the, the rod. They don't bend over and spool line out. But, um, and then we caught, we, we caught a good number of bigger ones on these coho killers, but this, this bait definitely caught more fish than those um, Brad's plugs. Um, 
You can also troll cut herring or full herring. I've done that in the past, um, but herring gets a little bit expensive. It's like seven fifty a a plate for uh, I think twenty baits, and um, you got to rig them up, and they're a little bit of a mess. Now we did wear use the herring to catch some of the um, the halibut. Um, the last bait I'm going to talk about is um, we didn't use these this year. We didn't do any snagging, but in the past um, you can snag salmon up there. Uh, this is a weighted uh, treble hook. You tie this onto your line and you watch the ripples come through the water when a big school of silver salmon comes swimming up the river. You have to do this in salt water. It's against the law to do it in fresh water. So at some of these hatcheries where the, the salmon come up the river, if you're in salt water, you can snag and you'll just cast into that school of fish and rip that, that hook through. And when you hook the back or a tail of a silver salmon that's 10 pounds, um, hold on to your hat because it'll rip your arm off. All right, let's go back to the presentation. Jump in, Don, if you got any other comments. The reason uh, we're showing you this is to uh, let you know you don't have to carry a lot of gear. Um, that You can take your, your fly rod, which, of course, if you've got a, a three-piece or a four-piece, you can carry that with your luggage on the plane. But uh, as soon as you arrive, uh, they give you a combination for this little locker that each one of the rooms have. And I was surprised because it all it all the equipment that's there is is good. I mean, it's it's just as good as anything that you, we might have to take. So that I mean, that's a real blessing to to know that. Um, the other issues are uh, that the trip that we're talking about that we were just on some of the some of the features that were good. I mean, great for us when you. When you get back after after you fished a while and you're tired, you take off your 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 wet garments. You're right there on that patio, if you remember where the uh, the, the places were lo located, the rooms. And each room or each apartment has its own deck, and there are hooks there. You can hang your stuff up. You take your wet boots off, and uh, when we were there, things things dried out pretty darn fast. So, you know, if you came in and you did that for lunch, you turned around and you go back, it's, most of it's pretty dried out. But uh, there's a lot of opportunities to uh, to go different places to fish. This is the this is the third time that I've been up there and I've, but the first time at this lodge. Uh, I, won't I won't dwell about the first two that we went on, but you'll see, quite a bit of it when we're going to show you some uh, uh, tapes that uh, we took uh, in just a few minutes. As far as this goes, you can take a look at the, the, the supply of fish that we take home. Um, as soon as you come in, you, you take your, your fish, you lay it out and of course wash it off. But then they've got these tables where you see the fillets that are laid out and, and we're the ones to do our own cleaning. And uh, so we, we do dress the fish and cut it into the pieces which are uh, on right in the middle of the screen here. But uh, then they uh, will put them in a, a, a card, or not a cardboard, but a plastic container and you uh, take those items and you uh, put them in the freezer immediately after you clean them. And then the, the staff there will come. They'll take them out after they're, they're frozen. And then they will put them in vacuum packed bags. And they do a great job of packaging them and putting 50 pounds of your fillets in a box. And that's that's the one you pay uh, to take home. And, uh, so it's really nice. And, and the, you, you can take more, but we discovered that it's, it's very expensive to do it that way. 
and I won't tell you why, but uh, it takes up too much time as well. The, uh, the planes that we flew on, we have a, a specific amount of uh, weight that we can carry, and that's 50 pounds on a suitcase and 50 pounds for your fish. And uh, they do charge you, but uh, if you took two boxes, it gets far more expensive. So, and, and I can tell you when you get home, 50 pounds of these fillets, will, they'll fill up your freezer for you <laughs> and uh, you can enjoy it for some time. Uh, and the other issue with the um, having two boxes is they actually wanted us to bring the first box over the day before uh, because of the weight consideration, the flight, the planes that we were flying only carry nine people right. plus your gear. So, other than that, um, the uh, the people that uh, where we work uh, or where we sleep and so on, the beds were great, uh, but you don't have any any maid service. It isn't a five star place. I'll tell you that, but. I think the only thing that was a frustration was the fact that we had to share our duties of washing dishes and cooking a meal. And, you know, half the time we didn't have time to get a breakfast at all because uh, our chief uh, in charge would get us up at 3.30 in the morning. And uh, that's that's the way it is. Because <laughs> we had, we you do have to drive uh, quite a distance to get to the rivers or the not to that, not down to where the boats are, but uh, you know, you don't get a lot of sleep until you get home. <laughs> so, <laughs> Up at three thirty in the morning and uh, to bed at nine was kind of our routine. Um, and part of that was, you know, either getting to the spots first um, or um, um, just making sure everything's prepped and ready to go. Yeah. So some of our challenges. So uh, in the world of COVID, uh, if you did not know this, Alaska was the one state in the US, Hawaii just started doing this, but Alaska required you to have a negative COVID test taken 72 hours before you flew, before you arrived in Alaska. So the four of us all did a service that was um, provided by the lodge um, it was 140 bucks, but, but, but they helped to service it. Yeah, uh, it was 140 bucks uh, on Tuesday. So we flew Friday morning. On Tuesday, we had a FedEx package from the lab to uh, deposit our um, swab that went back in your throat and swabbed your throat, and you put that back in the FedEx package and you took it to FedEx. And on Wednesday morning. Uh, Don, mine, and Steve's packages arrived at the lab in New Orleans. Now, whoever picks a lab in New Orleans during hurricane season should be fired. But, you know, to me, that's like picking a lab in Fairbanks, Alaska in January to do a test. Because the week before, there was a hurricane that was coming pretty close to New Orleans, and they're all like, you guys might need to come up with a different testing plan because the lab may get flooded or shut down. Fortunately, it, well, fortunately it missed. Unfortunately, it went up through Lake Charles and that part of Louisiana got it, kind of where this next one's coming. Um, but our buddy, David Adams, his test did not go to the lab on Wednesday. It didn't get there until Thursday morning. We all got our tests back Wednesday night he didn't find out until Thursday at five o'clock that he had a negative test and we were flying Friday morning at seven. So no stress there. Now, our experience when we got to Ketchikan was it was really an honor system. It was really, you got off the flight, you walked downstairs, you got your baggage, you got in a line and you showed him your documentation that you had your negative test. You did have to log in online and show that you tested negative. Now. If one of us had gotten sick, we probably would have gotten in a little trouble if you didn't go through all the, the testing and stuff. But <clears throat> I'm sure there were a few people that just got off the plane and walked into, walked in and got onto uh, the Ketchikan Island or a, a flight elsewhere. Um, it was not as 
rigorous as I thought it was going to be um, once we got there. So um, I think we've covered these other two topics, the plane. Um, so when we did stay in, in Ketchikan, I'll let Don tell us, give us your experience and when we stayed in Ketchikan in a couple of minutes. Uh, we had a good time. It was, uh, you know, as I said before, this was not a, a five-star trip. I have had, I've had that the first two times I went. Uh, it was, everybody waited on you. We had everything. But in this particular case, we didn't. We had your buddy, and that, and so it was a team effort. In part, it kind of reminded me of back in the fraternity years when, <laughs> you know, your buddy may not be as, as thorough with the you are with doing the dishes and all that sort of thing. So it was something that uh, it was amusing. We all made it, but uh, anyway, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of socializing. We, we, uh, the weather, the place. If you haven't been there, it's so beautiful. Flying in the plains and even driving just through the fields. And I, for 12 years, I lived up in Oregon, and uh, I think I'd rather take the, the extra uh, issue and go up further because it is really nice. And it's all, uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, lumberjacking up there with. Uh, in that perspective and you can see where they've done it but uh it, it it was a great trip highly recommend it and it's it's not that expensive uh not like the first two that i went on which were but uh yeah because i made you cook your own food yep. yeah and uh, some some days you know well as i said before he jumped he would get us to jump on that truck and get going right away so there was no breakfast you took a couple bars in your in your satchel and then these <laughs> yes, that was it <laughs> yeah in uh in ketchikan because it's a cruise stop and all the cruise ships are are shut down right now ketchikan was a ghost town so there were literally 85 percent plus of the businesses are closed we did get dinner we had the restaurants we did get to eat uh most of them were in the hotels but the food was great uh, they did have bars and they were serving. So that, you know, that was another issue, but um, it was fun. But uh, other than that, which we didn't have any problems with the traffic congestion or anything like that. Uh, well, I will say, and, and we mentioned it earlier, Kevin did, the, the fog does come in. I mean, there's, there's, steep areas that uh, you don't know uh, are there. And then you turn around in a curve in the truck and there, it's, there it is, it's a blank wall. So you have to be very careful in driving, but uh, it's a great trip. So I've posted pictures of this trip and other trips out on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you do a Google search or if you do a YouTube search on my other office, Outdoor Adventures, um, they're also linked off of my personal homepage there kevinmcconnell.info slash outdoor. Um, I'm going to jump over and play a four minute uh, YouTube video and then we'll jump back and uh, answer any questions. So post any questions you've got to the, um, the channel there and um, watch this video here. It's the Kevin, David, Don and Steve game show. <laughs> I'll take skunks for 500. <laughs> Don, what's your fish call? Eeyaw. Eeyaw. Ceviche. <laughs> I was minding my own business and Alaska struck. Thank <laughs> you. 
zoom in here and um, just give you a lay of the land here of where we uh, spent a bunch of our time. Oops. Let's uh, cancel that. We don't want to watch the next video. Um, so this is Thorn Bay here. The town is in here. So when you've got your uh, upgrade boat, you basically run out of Thorn Bay here. And then we fish anywhere, all of this down this edge, across over here, all the way up here to Myers Chuck. Um, this is called Union Bay. We fish back in here, all around this area. I've actually had, I've been on some of the charter boats where we've actually run up to this island um, and uh, back into here. We've actually seen some grizzly bears back up in here when we've been up here fishing, but. This is kind of the area that uh, you fish offshore. And then um, I don't know how exactly how many rivers are on the island, but um, they all have, you know, a run of salmon in them. So it's a matter of, you know, going out and exploring and finding, uh, finding the fish. And it's, you know, it's a, you know, I'd say every year is different on timing and, um, you know, I was there one year at the 4th of July and they were running great and went the next year and they weren't running so great. So it's, um, but that's fishing. So it's a great place to go explore and um, we'll open it up. Um, one other thing, Kevin, you mentioned it once earlier, but when we were there, the tide, uh, when you look at that the, from the, 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 the ocean to the, to the fresh water, there's a variation from 15 to 16 feet twice a day. Is that correct? And yeah. It, and it's just, it's, a, it's fantastic. I mean, just to see the change. I mean, it's not like, you know, say, hey, we're not going to fish at this pole because we got all the fish from there. Not true because <laughs> a whole other school comes in. <laughs> so the one, the one tidbit I'll give everybody is you want to fish the tides. So the best time to fish the salmon to be trolling or in the rivers around the tides is an hour before high tide to an hour after. Well, it pretty much, once it hits high tide, they'll stop running. So that hour and a half to hour before up to high tide is great. Uh, and then down around the low tide change. So there is... Um, those are the good times to say. David Burns also just posted, he said, make sure I mentioned that there is a tackle shop at the lodge. Um, there's tackle shops in Cloak and Craig, um, but there is one at the at Adventure Alaska. Uh, it's on the honor system. You basically walk in, grab whatever you need, write it on a sheet of paper, and they charge they total it up for your bill at the end of the at the end of the week. So there's also grocery stores. Not there's not one. We what do we have? Two or three. There's a grocery store in Thorn Bay and uh, in Cloak. Yep.
Anything else? That's a wrap. Ping Don or I, if you got any questions offline. Um, Give us a call. And uh, well, it looks like a heck of a trip. Back over to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. And um, let's, I got a couple of questions. I'm going to bring them back in. Jimmy, why don't you bring them, both of them back in, please. And so temperature wise, what, you know, what's the temperature there in early September and when you're out on the boat or in the river or something like that? What, 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 we, were, we had beautiful, clear days. Uh, the only thing, as I said before, that was a problem was the fog in the mornings. And uh, it was, <laughs> and it was also the first, uh, on the first flight over from Ketchikan uh, to our lodge area, uh, it was really touch and go. <laughs> you had to know where the, you were flying through. I'll tell you that. It was in the 50s at night and uh, low 60s during the day. The week we were there, it was sunny the whole week. They'd had two months of rain before we got there. It had rained every day for the 60 days before we got there. And then it, wow. then it got sunny. We brought some of our Texas weather with us, and it followed us up there. Well, it was good to see, Don, that you wore your Austin Woods and Waters cap. I noticed that in there. Thanks for carrying the Woods and Waters flag up there to Alaska. I do want to give you one fishing tip, though. When you're in that river, Keep your rod tip up. You'll be much better landing yeah, those yeah, fish with your yeah. rod tip up. When you've got, when you've got a, a fish as big as what I had on there, don't worry. I know how to catch fish. <laughs> <laughs> I caught more than most of them that, that, in that trip. I'll tell you that. Kevin won't admit that. That's okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody's chiming in on their, on their comments here about what a good presentation that is. So thank you for your time today. And, uh, I'm going to have to uh, bump this up on my my bucket list of trips, uh, Florida Keys first, and maybe Baja Peninsula first, uh, uh, or the Mexican Yucatan. Uh, but I need to get to Alaska, as, as uh, I know you've got a, a tremendous love for it, Kevin, there. So thanks for sharing that today. I want to remind everybody about our uh, October 22nd uh, event. So please uh, log back into this YouTube channel or this Facebook page on the 22nd and um, be sure to um, uh, bid on our live auction items. Be sure to listen to who's going to get some money from the McBride's Foundation. One thing I did forget to mention earlier is we do have a raffle that uh, we are uh, getting some tickets for. So if you want to buy a raffle ticket, they're 20 bucks each and uh, the prizes that you can choose from we're going to pull uh, three tickets three raffle tickets the first guy gets to choose from a Franke instinct l 20 gauge over and under shotgun uh, a three weeknight stay at a laguna madre bay house and then a 20 quart uh, south jetty cooler and so the first guy gets to um pick one of those three items. Second guy gets to pick the remaining two and the third guy gets the, gets the last item there. I suspect I know which order they're going to go in, but uh, don't know for sure on there. So please check our website uh, or reach out to Marianne. She's handling those tickets and can uh, get you taken care of on raffle tickets there. So uh, that money is going to um, go to the McBride's foundation directly the Woods and Waters Club will be the benefit from the live auction. So uh, thank you. Y'all get back to work today and uh, produce, uh, be a producer in society. And let's go out hunting and fishing and talk about it next time. Thank you for uh, your time today. Thanks, Kevin and Don. Adios.